Hello and welcome. On behalf of the Center for Advanced Studies in Child Welfare, this is the first of three modules which cover the topic of applying positive psychology and other helpful strategies to the well-being of child welfare workers. My name is Amy Krenzman. I'm an assistant professor of social work at the University of Minnesota School of Social Work, and I study positive psychology as it is applied to the early stage of addiction recovery. And I'm Tony Tonetti. I am a research assistant for Dr. Krenzman at the School of Social Work. I am currently completing my master's degree here, and I'm working with preschoolers and elementary and middle school age children in a community mental health center. This is the start of the first module. We call it Problems and Solutions, but I just wanna say a few words about the three modules as a set. Here, we've developed these modules to impact the welfare and well-being of the employee, of the child welfare worker, and we're drawing from the research evidence to first talk about some of the stressors on the job, some of the difficult things that you face on a daily basis, what the research has to say about it, but then we're going to move away from those problems and start to offer some solutions, some activities that we're going to be suggesting that put the research uh, on wellness into use in your own life and into use in your own workplace. So please stay with us through the three modules and we'll be giving you some suggestions for how to take the research evidence on wellness and put it into practice in your own lives in ways that we really hope will contribute to an upward spiral for your own personal life and your own professional life and the people you work with. Before we go on, we really want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts on behalf of the School of Social Work. We really appreciate that your jobs are not easy. We appreciate that you're there to stand for children who have very often no one else to speak for them. These children are extremely vulnerable and we appreciate everything you do on their behalf and on the behalf of their families. It's not lost on us how very difficult your work is and that you, you are choosing to be helpful in these areas, so we thank you. The agenda for the first module is as follows. We'll start with some discussion of some of the problems that are found in child welfare work settings, including burnout and compassion fatigue. And then we're going to suggest some solutions, some possible solutions the concept of compassion satisfaction, what positive psychology might have to offer, and, and some cognitive behavioral strategies that might be helpful. We draw uh, from the research literature for our discussion. So starting out, we will present some research. We did a literature review on burnout and turnover in the field of child welfare. So turnover of child welfare employees is experienced as a national problem. Um, national estimates of annual turnover rates are between 30 and 40 percent. In a survey of Minnesota counties just last year in 2015, an annual turnover rate of 25 percent was reported to be reasonable, suggesting much higher rates are actually experienced. And turnover is an issue because it's been linked with poorer child outcomes, poorer quality of services, and increased caseloads. What the research says about um, turnover is that it comes from an employee's intent to leave. So while we can't look at why people actually left their jobs, because by that time they're gone, um, we can see what makes them want to leave their job. And what the literature suggests are that there's three kind of main components, job satisfaction, organizational climate, and burnout. And we're going to look at all three of these separately, starting with job satisfaction. This can be defined very simply as the extent to which people like or dislike their jobs. It um, impacts one's sense of personal accomplishment, and it is one of the most significant factors in contributing to burnout. And we will go in to define and discuss burnout more in detail shortly. Job satisfaction is affected by the agency's organizational climate. And so looking at the organizational climate next, what kind of goes into that. 
can be defined as employees' perceptions of their work environment. And it can be thought of as including four components. Role clarity, uh, which is clarity about one's tasks and characteristics in their work environment. Personal accomplishment, the sense that one is personally able to do many worthwhile things and remain personally involved in their work. Emotional exhaustion, which is a feeling of emotional or psychological exhaustion from the demands of the work and a feeling of being unable to complete tasks. And then workload, which is really just feeling like there's too much to do and that it can't all be done. And what the literature suggests is that emotional exhaustion really is one of the most important factors in determining organizational quality. So emotional exhaustion both predicts and is predicted by organizational variables. So there's kind of a cyclical nature to this. So this is really one of the key components that um, we will be talking about. Higher ratings of organizational climate were associated with less intent to leave. So in reviewing all the literature, this consistently came up as a, a key factor in looking at turnover and why employees leave their jobs. The stressful work environment is a primary factor that increases turnover among child welfare workers. Finally, we'll, we're going to look at burnout. As many as 50% of child welfare workers report experiencing symptoms of burnout. So this is really affecting a large majority of the, or a large section of child welfare workers. It is composed of three um, aspects. Depersonalization, which is an unfeeling and impersonal response Towards, towards one's clients. So not having compassion, empathy, um, not having any emotions towards the clients that one is working with. Emotional exhaustion that we discussed, just feeling overextended and exhausted by the duties in one's job. And burnout involves a reduced sense of personal accomplishment. So a lack of feelings of competence and successful achievement in one's work with people. Compassion fatigue is often talked about as synonymous with burnout, and the literature does have some slight distinctions between the two. They're certainly related. Compassion fatigue is also known as secondary traumatic stress, and this comes from resulting the stress resulting from helping or wanting to help a traumatized or suffering person. Where burnout is more of a process, it can take some time, there's many different things contributing to it, Compassion fatigue is able to happen after a single event. It can be more acute um, and is sometimes easier to resolve, but it does lead to burnout. And there are several factors that can make compassion fatigue more likely, including poor self-care, unresolved trauma in the worker, an inability to control work stressors, and a lack of job satisfaction. Compassion fatigue may lead to what some authors call human languishing, this brings emotional distress, psychosocial impairment, limitations in daily activities, and lost work days. So this can really affect the worker far beyond just their job. It really goes into their personal life as well. So we've just heard a, a fair amount um, from Tony about things that can go wrong in the, in the workplace, in, in child welfare, and some of the evidence uh, about workers wanting to, to leave the job and how they feel about it in the organizational climate. And you might start to think that this sounds like a downward spiral. Um, but we want to present the idea that of the possibility of also an upward spiral. So for example, whereas Tony talked about some negative factors in the workplace, such as a negative organizational climate, emotional exhaustion, turnover, and compassion fatigue, and she talked also about how the research literature says that a negative organizational climate creates emotional exhaustion and emotional exhaustion also contributes to a negative organizational climate. These things influence each other and make each other worse. And those things can lead to a downward spiral where um, these factors are feeding off of each other and things are getting worse generally. But we want to, this slide is the slide where we transition from the problem to some of the things that we hope we can offer to you as possible solutions. And we want to suggest a phrase from the positive psychology literature, 
which is the, the idea of an upward spiral, that there are positive things that can be introduced into the, into the culture, into the environment that uh, the worker can have some control over that can help to build the good things can also build on each other and contribute to to an upward spiral spiral things getting hopefully better and better some of those factors that we'll be covering in this set of modules are the idea of positive communication communication strategies when with colleagues uh, with uh, supervisors and supervisees and even with clients that can help restore um, restore ourselves and also um, shore up uh, the, the feelings of the other person who you're talking to. Positive activity scheduling is a behavioral intervention that we'll be talking about that can be helpful in making sure that there's more positive events happening in your life that can contribute to feelings of gratitude, which can lead to more positive emotion. Uh, behavioral activation is also a behavioral intervention that um, we're going to be talking about in the coming slides that can help, again, fuel this, en this engine of an upward spiral where one of these things leads to more of the other and things start to get better and better. So this slide is our transition slide from kind of hearing about what the problem is to hopefully suggesting some things from the research literature that can serve as solutions. I'm going to start by giving you a background in positive psychology. One of the things we'll be suggesting in one of the um, second or third modules is a gratitude practice that comes from the positive psychology field. So I thought I would introduce the field as a way to get us started. What is positive psychology? A very common metaphor used to describe positive psychology is the metaphor of a compass. And the idea here is that helping clients go from pathology to neutral is sort of like going on the compass is sort of all the activity that's south. And authors have written that the activity of positive psychology takes place north of neutral. In other words, positive psychology picks up where pathology based intervention leaves off. That is, it starts when people are at a neutral place and helps them build toward flourishing. So they say north of neutral. Positive psychology addresses the area north of neutral, and that can include a focus, a scientific focus on wellness and well being, on flourishing, on positive organizations, on positive interventions, on optimal functioning, on positive affect, and on character strengths and virtues. One of the primary theories of positive psychology um, is called the broaden and build theory of positive emotion. And this theory really speaks to the idea of an upward spiral. According to this theory, it's, the model starts with positive emotion and posits that even fleeting momentary positive emotions, that is feeling, feeling good, good, good and positive um, uh, feelings of wellness, um, so even brief positive emotions can lead to a broadening of psychosocial resources. Now, how does that work? When people feel well and feel more optimistic, feel more upbeat, um, they might be willing to take a little bit of a risk, maybe try something new, reach out to someone else, make a new friend, and those things can form more lasting psychosocial resources. So whereas the positive emotion might be fleeting, um, the, the psychosocial resources that, that are sometimes the result of positive emotions are more lasting and more solid and can build toward an improved feeling of life satisfaction. In our modules, we will also be suggesting some cognitive behavioral strategies that can help to fuel the upward spiral. And so I just wanted to briefly review the basic idea behind cognitive behavioral strategies. And that is simply that um, the way you feel, what you do, and what you think are all related to one another. We're going to be suggesting in module number two a couple of behavioral strategies that can be put into place right away that hopefully will be will result in different behaviors that will result in more positive thoughts, 
and more positive emotions. And then those positive emotions can fuel the broaden and build cycle. So one way that this positive psychology um, can really be used in working with clients and some of the secondary traumatic stress that may be experienced in, in the field of child welfare is compassion satisfaction. Compassion satisfaction um, may result instead of fatigue when one experiences positive emotions. Uh, when you experience the joy of helping others in your work, you are more likely to experience the satisfaction with your work. And this leads to compassion satisfaction and fulfillment. And using positive psychology may help workers experience the satisfaction instead of fatigue. Human flourishing is something that is, um, has been defined as part of compassion satisfaction. And that's thought of as providing care within um, an optimal range to connote goodness, flexibility, learning, growth, and resilience in the face of, of work demands. So in spite of these negative situations and experiences, actually seeing the positive side of things and flourishing with that. This is kind of an opposition of the human languishing that we talked about that is experienced with compassion fatigue. So flourishing leads to job satisfaction, which as we've talked about is a, one of the main contributors to intent to leave and turnover. And positive affect um, and good self-care can increase one's physical, intellectual, and social resources, as Amy talked about with the broaden and build theory. And these three things can help one have a higher positivity to negativity ratio in their thinking and feeling. And having this higher positivity to negativity ratio will lead to experiencing compassion satisfaction as opposed to compassion fatigue. So this is one way that um, positive psychology can be used in this work to promote compassion satisfaction and mitigate some of these negative effects. So how can we promote the development of compassion satisfaction? The literature suggests several things that have been found to be helpful in um, some, some child welfare agencies and organizations. Providing opportunities for employees to discuss difficulties, um, to talk about their secondary trauma and any other emotional issues that they're experiencing may reduce their level of emotional exhaustion. And this can be promoted in supervision. Investing in the relationship between the worker and supervisor promotes individual support to workers and is one thing that agencies can really do to address high turnover. And then what may result from this is that supervisors help their workers feel supported in the supervisory relationship. Those workers may then be more available to provide the same kind of support to their coworkers. And coworker support is another thing that's really been found to be helpful. Social support may serve as a protective factor to developing traumatic stress. Now, what a lot of the literature suggests is that, and what you would expect, is that when you experience a high amount of emotional exhaustion, you're going to experience a low level of job satisfaction. And both of these things are going to contribute to burnout and turnover. There was one study that found that workers, some workers experienced a high level of emotional exhaustion, but they also had a high level of job satisfaction and not much intent to leave. And what they found was common in these workers is co support from their coworkers and that that really mitigated the impact of the emotional exhaustion and, and made them more happy in their jobs. Finally, using active and engaged coping strategies moving towards the problem instead of being passive and moving away from the problem. Um, these things include problem solving, cognitive restructuring, seeking social support, and expressing emotions. Having these kinds of coping strategies make it so that you're less likely to depersonalize clients and more likely to experience a sense of personal accomplishment. Depersonalization and personal accomplishment both being major um, or two of the factors of burnout. So all of these things coming together um, can really impact each other and make one more happy in their job and more likely to experience compassion and satisfaction. So what we've talked about so far can really be expressed by the nested 
level of systems that we are very familiar with in social work, micro, meso, and macro. At the macro level, we talked about organizational culture. At the meso level, we talked about how important your relationships with coworkers and supervisors are in the workplace. And at the micro level, that would represent the individual workers' emotions and behavior. And each of these, at each of these systemic levels, we could imagine things going not so well. We could imagine a negative organizational culture, negative relationships with coworkers and supervisors, and at the level of the individual worker, negative emotion and also behaviors that are not supportive of health and well being. And we know from systems theory that when something is not uh, functioning well at one of these systemic levels, it's going to affect the other levels. But luckily, the same thing is also true with positive shifts in these different levels. We can imagine a positive organizational culture that would support workplace relationships that are supportive and productive. And we can imagine individuals, individual workers who have positive emotions in the workplace and are engaging in behaviors that are healthy and supportive of wellness. Based on systems theory, when things go right at any of these systemic levels, it will positively influence the other levels and lead to what we talked about earlier in terms of upward spirals. And we're going to be drawing on the research literature in the next couple of modules. In the next module, module number two, we're going to focus on the individual and what can be done at the level of the worker in order to build positive emotion and also positive behavior. And by that, we mean good health behaviors as well as fun and pleasurable activities. In the third module, we are going to talk about some evidence-based things that can be done to enhance and improve relationships in the workplace. And those are going to be related to positive communication skills. So in module two and in module three, we're gonna talk about the research literature, but we're also gonna offer you some concrete strategies of how to take the research and put it into use, into your life, into your personal life, into your work relationships to help start this positive spiral going. Um, these are things we feel um, an individual can do that are within the realm of uh, an individual's own choice that can help start to reverse negativity. Therefore, in module two, we called module two, fill your watering can. We're gonna talk about gratitude, behavioral activation, positive activity scheduling. Gratitude is from positive psychology. Behavioral activation and positive activity scheduling are cognitive and behavioral strategies. And we're going to introduce you to those from a research perspective, but also we're gonna give you a strategy for putting these things to actual use and making them come to life. Uh, and we are recommending a journaling practice that we'll present in module number two. In module number three, we're calling that pour from a full can. So whereas in module two, you've filled your watering can, you're now ready to take what you have and with coworkers, supervisors, and clients, employ some positive communication techniques that will help uh, support this upward spiral in module three, we're going to talk about reflective supervision, Carl Rogers, re the research on listening, and offer you these positive communication skills. Once you hear those, uh, those suggestions, you'll be able to put them to use immediately. Thank you for viewing module number one, and thank you for joining us uh, on this journey, and we'll see you in module two.